we, instead of playing these games, we teach our children how to exercise. We teach them how to use equipment. We teach them how to run. Because when we do these things, we're setting them up in the future to continue these habits, to care for themselves. Um, and then care for intimate others and global others. Intimate others means your family, your friends, but also your community. It means volunteering. It means working with those younger children and even working with older generations to glean from their wisdom, to learn from them. Um, it just means to reach out and help your neighbor when they're in times of need. Global others is tricky because while she doesn't want you to just give your money away to the first charity that comes along because so many of these charities, you don't know where your money is going. She says that you should research, find out where your money is going, what it's doing, make sure it's not lining some politician's <coughs> pocket because in this world that happens a lot today. She says just to look it up, to make sure that before you give, you're giving to the right people. Um, care for plants, animals, and the environment. A lot of times we learn the parts of a plant, the parts of an animal. <coughs> but how many times do we actually grow plants, unless you're like in an ag class? She suggests that we have all students grow plants in greenhouses, or maybe even if it's like I put a plant in my room and I make different students water it every day. I remember when I was in middle school, we had this one teacher who had plants in her room that she treated like they were her children, y'all. They had names. They had names. And I mean, we don't have to go to that extreme, but she definitely cared for those plants, and her students knew they better not hurt those plants or they were going to be in trouble. So, I mean, you don't have to go name your plants in your classroom, but hey, maybe you can throw a flower in there or something. But she also says, like, what about caring for animals? I mean, not everybody, like a family pet, yes, that helps you to learn. But not everybody can have a pet, and we have to learn that animals have feelings, animals have emotions, and how we treat them. They feel pain, they feel sadness like we do, and we have to learn how to cope with that. And uh, she even suggests having some of your science teachers have classroom animals that they learn about, they can look at, they can help, they can watch them grow while they learn about their skeletal structure. Something as simple as that for learning to care for these. And with the environment, we have to do better about recycling. We have to have community cleanup days, school cleanup days, where we just go and pick up trash, just help out around our, our community. And then the only thing I kind of have a problem with, with noddings, is she says that we should maybe De, like devalue certain subjects that we don't see as important to our future. But how many of us changed majors like four times in college? Mm -hmm. How many of us did our interests change during high school? So maybe like I say, I'm not going to take much math in high school. I'll take the basics and skip everything else because I don't, I don't need it. I don't like math. I'm never going to use it. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to go to nursing school. How much math am I going to need? So much of it. I've never taken it. So I can see some kind of flaws. There has to be a balance because there are some required courses that we need <clears throat> but we should we should have freedom to choose but at the same time we also have to help guide our students say I know you don't like math but someday you might actually need it in whatever you're doing so how how do I incorporate this in my history classroom in your classrooms one way that Nani specifically points out for history it says that we need to evaluate our national history because when we evaluate it it can reflect on current affairs we're dealing with. And I agree with that. What we study in history, not like people always say history repeats itself, which is somewhat true, but also it just helps us to learn how to deal with problems that we face in this world. How do we deal with them then? How can we deal with them now based on what they did? Can we make it better? Can we make it worse? What are we going to do? Also, I can, I like the idea of moving out with my students. That's something I would want to do. <coughs> because I can, I can learn what interests them and have them build upon that. When I'm working with, with Tia, my, my studio school student, I learned that she wants to be a pediatrician. And so if she were in my history class, I could tell her, hey Tia, why don't you research the first female pediatrician, the first African American doctor. Tell me the history of medicines. Where did they come from? How did modern medicine begin? Because that interests her, so she's finding out things she likes, but she's also finding out the history of them. And so that's a way to tie that to our classes. If we know our students and we know what interests them, then we can reach out to them better and teach them better. 
And that's, I mean, that's the basis of this book, just learning it. So what do we take away? We know our students. We give them models. We show them how to be moral students. We show them all the continuities. We give them purpose. We give them a place. We give them relationships. And then we focus on those things of care to make sure that they know that as students, they're always welcome to come to us with any problem they ever have. Thank you.